Hi, I'm Albert. You should be able to operate and inspect and debug and play with and change a running distributed software system all from within your editor. So this is a simple closure script environment where you can see the value of any expression. You just hit a shortcut and it wraps it in this, what I call a query macro. If you change the expression and save, the value will update. If you put a bang before the expression, the value will change on every key press inside. You have all of the power of closure available in here. So things like functions just work. There's a special version of the query macro to use in threading macros, and it automatically detects whether you're in a thread first or thread last macro. So you can really see the flow of how your data changes between transformations. Right. You can inspect asynchronous values, JavaScript promises. Let's see that again. You saw this change from pending to fulfilled here. Let's look again. There you go. And that also works within crazy nested structures. Like here we've got a map of vectors with many promises awaiting on each other. If you evaluate this, you will see the data streaming in here as they come in. And this is just regular text. You can do all your normal text editor motions with it, select it, copy it, whatever. Let's just see that again, because it's fun. There we go, that was the last one up here. Okay, the thing is, fairly performant, not just in terms of frame rate, but also um, in robustness to things like uh, new lines, indentation, mouse cursor action, selection, etc. I use this thing as a simple to-do list. Down here I see the number of different things I have to do. Um, I use this to keep my workouts and if you want to like increase by 3% next time, it does these calculations for me down here. Um, it's a great calculator scratch pad. And of course, it's really fun for things like coding. So here's a function and some unit tests. And to see the functions turn green as you type is really fun too. It's also a distributed system and I can run code on any node in my system if I know the ID of that node. In this case, I got my, my RPI set up here and it has this ID and now I can run code on it. And I do that by saying on the RPI, this function should run. Now this function receives as arguments, all of the host platform capabilities. What are they? Let's inspect them. So here in this Pi, we see things like the GPIO pin, um, some LCD stuff, the serial port and some file system functions, and we can do things with them. For example, let's take the capabilities for the GPIO pins and let's play with them. Oops, like so. And we can just toggle our LEDs by toggling some Booleans in our code. Each time we change the code, remember there's a bang in front of the expression, this entire thing redeploys. So we swap out the entire function that's being run on the RPI. The editor is also a node in the distributed system, and we can run functions on it. In this case, the editor receives capabilities such as the, um, like toggling this help thing down here, toggling the line numbers, uh, setting the theme. Let's try to change that here. So each time I pick a new color, it changes the text, which then redeploys the function, and it's it's quite smooth. Um, let's uh, undo that change again. There we go. All right, um, yeah, and another capability is importing stuff. So that up here I have the importing any JavaScript package and I import that URL and it just, it just works. I can put JavaScript packages in all the nodes, including the editor. Okay, this entire thing is open world through these capabilities. Now, while they are the only way to access the outside world, they are flexible enough to do, well, anything with them. So here on this RPI again, um, I'm looking at the root file system. Let's query that. There we go. And now I can walk around, like, what sounds interesting. I don't know. He says, um, block RAM zero size. There we go. Or something like proc status, probably fun. Uh, 
this one slash here. There we go. So there you see the live content of some file in your editor. If you want to stop this, just put a minus there. Right. Um, let's look at some ways to do state. A very simple way to do state is to do to pass it onto the next iteration of the process function. And rerunning or looping this process function is a capability itself. So when you call rerun, you give it a wait time and then there you give it the next argument, which is gonna be passed into your state fun into your process function on the next iteration. And here we just toggle that quickly to make the LED blink. If we decrease that, it will blink faster. Let's look at another way to do state. In this example, I want to put some text on the LCD that's connected via serial. Now, opening a serial port returns some JavaScript host platform object, a stateful thing. And we can mark this sub-expression as stateful by, well, wrapping it in a stateful expression and giving it some stable ID. Now, we've opened that serial port, and this S0 will always be the same object with all of its dependencies, even if we change the code around it. So let's write something to the LCD. Okay, fine. Another feature is called process reconciliation. Um, we've got a node here with our blinky LEDs and there are three processes running on this node. So these are the process IDs and that's the function. And we can stop a process by just commenting it out. So now the only the yellow one is blinking, let's stop that too. And to start up a process again, just Comment it back in again. The node scheduler really looks at the list of processes it should be running and the one that it's currently running and then it starts or stops processes to match our latest wish. Another very important feature when you're working in a distributed running system is to look at very specific instances of your code running, say on this particular node or whatever this user is looking at or trace some request ID across your system. And you can do that with a feature called query context. So here I've got three nodes that are sensors and I wanna run the same code in all of them. I can easily do that by just putting them in a vector and then feeding that to the node. So I say, I wanna run this function on all of these nodes. And what this function does is just read the serial and call a function called CO2. Let's define that function here. And what that function receives is, well, look at it. Um, random fluctuating values because all of these CO2 sensors are just throwing in their values into the same function here. What we want to do is really look into one specific sensor out there and we can do that by wrapping that in our context and say we want to look at the PID of office here and when I do that you see the measurement is much more stable now it's around 490. Um, let's look at the living room uh oh, no, not too great of an error. Um, let's check the kitchen. That's okay. So you can really focus down into one specific instance of your code. Now, of course, you can attach arbitrary custom metadata to this context. Like here we've got a simple document viewing application. Um, and here we set up a context where we attach the username of the user that's currently logged in. And this will propagate not only through the call stack dynamically, but also over asynchronous boundaries in JavaScript. So anywhere else in our application, whatever function we're looking at that is being touched by that call stack with this context set up down here, we can just query that context. So in this case, we have some component here that shows a document, and we can see what user Dave is looking at by just inspecting that. And it looks like some astronomy stuff here. All right. Let's see what user Sventec is up to. Oh, uh oh. Well, I didn't see that. Let's just go back to our happy little blinking LEDs. Right, here we've got three processes again of blinking LEDs and here's the function that implements them. And because I wrote this, I know for a fact that B here contains the value of the pin. So if we inspect that, it's either true or false. And it's scoped to the green one only. Um, and you see that syncs up with the one in the real world, but that's okay, but it would be really much nicer if we could visualize this somehow in the editor. And we can, we can just define a function, let's call it fizz here, which takes that value. And then if that value is true, we show something that looks like a green LED. And if not, something that looks like an LED that's turned off. 
And we can now use that function in here to visualize this value in the code. And you see, it's much more fun to look at, to really rebuild parts of the world that interest you in the code while you're looking at the real world. Um, you can do, of course, a much fancier version of that. Here we've got basically the same, but it looks at the context of the node to show different colored orbs. And down here we have many contexts side by side. And you see they all match up as it is. You also see that these contexts scope lexically. So the outer context here is the green one, which controls that down here. And there's two more context expressions that just showed red and yellow right here. Okay. There's also a history of values saved in the editor. So we can just show the last values of this LED by uh, piping this through the history function here. And then we will see a not too terribly useful list of all the state changes. But we can modify this a little bit to juxt the timestamp onto that. And now we've got a timestamp log scrolling through our editor live with all of these state changes of that particular expression in that context of the real world here. Right, last demo. We can, of course, return HTML from our visualization functions and mark that with a special metadata attribute to tell it that it should render in a certain way. So here we can just visualize and that renders the world's lowest budget bar chart right in our code. Might be useful for something. That's it for the demo. Let's now look at the inspirations of this work. So it's obviously inspired by Smalltalk and Lisp systems, Emacs with org mode especially. There's the idea of serializing or round tripping much of the state via regular old plain text. The explicit trace, trace points with context are from APX. Having IDs in the code to give stable identity to some expressions, I first saw that in the Captain Proto schema definitions. Various music live coding environments have been experimenting with self rewriting textual code and very custom inline visualizations that really surface the runtime state directly in your code. And they generally have a very high degree of liveness. They really make the code feel like it's come alive. On the more general theme of better tools for thought or reduced incidental complexity, that was Eve and their start classic, which has deploy as you type. And it also shows production data and traces right in the editor. There's Jamie Brandon's draft of an interactive closure notebook style thing, which has self rewriting code. And it's at the same time, the UI and the database um, that also feels really similar to this project. So this is part of the tech stack that I wish I had when I started my tiny SaaS business nine years ago, uh, operating and developing a clinical information system as a solo developer. It's also aimed at hobbyists and solo developers that want something fun and very low ceremony and who do not care for performance or correctness at all. None of the ideas here are new. Uh, it's just the implementation is also really basic. It's just a few great libraries, mostly Clojure, glued together under 3000 lines of code. There's no error handling, no code base management. So everything has to be in a single buffer right now. There's no data persistence story. There's no networking or data conveyance between nodes. But I feel like that's something where electric closure could fit perfectly, where you could define the entirety of your system in a single expression. And then the compiler would infer the network boundaries automatically. Um, there's no collaboration, but ideally I'd like to be able to share a link to you to edit this particular function. And you can see the data streaming through that function, but only as anonymized through a function under my control. That's something that should be possible with a good implementation of OCAP. But yeah, object capability security in here as it is implemented is not secure yet, so don't use this for anything. It's really just an experiment now. Um, needs to also to be rewritten as a proper editor extension to really be useful. So what have we seen? It's a plain text editor that is part of the distributed system. It shows runtime values, enter history, right here in the editor as live text. These values can be visualized through functions that you also write. There is declarative deployment 
um, you assign functions to nodes saying this should run there. Stopping a process is just commenting it out. There's capability security. A process function receives as arguments all of the host platform capabilities as arguments that it can then delegate small slices of to other functions. Yeah, none of this is new, just a few ideas of the past 60 years recombined um, in one of many different ways, obviously. Thank you for watching. Bye.